Welcome to another edition of Chadwell University, working through the maze of refrigerants and the different choices that are out there to replace your R22. Let me first say by start off by saying that the best thing you can always do to be the most efficient is going to go with 410A. 410A is going to be more efficient than R22, but again, that's new equipment and new installs. So I do understand that there would be a financial burden to change units out just simply because you're low on refrigerant. So we do need to have a replacement refrigerant in our toolbox. And with so many choices, the constant question I always get is, which one is the best? First, I want to say you have to define what you define as the best. Is it efficiency? Is it ease of use? Is it all round? To me, the, each one of the different refrigerants that are out there has a very unique place in the market, and each one would fulfill and be the best in different applications. But for the multifamily housing industry and where we need to be, we need to eventually get to 410A. But in the interim, we need a fast alternative that we can put into our systems without a lot of oil changes and retrofitting. So we need a refrigerant that we can drop in, if you will. And what I mean by drop in, and I try to clear it up in every one of the refrigerant videos, is that a drop in is to remove your old existing charge of R22. Once you do that, handle it carefully, put it in your recovery cylinder, and use that used R22 on different units that you have throughout your property so that you can reuse that refrigerant. If you've decided to retrofit or change over a system to one of the other drop-ins, remove it all, run a vacuum, change your valve stems. You may even want to consider, if you open the system, to change the dryer. One of the one we're going to talk about today is 421A. 421A, I really, out of all of them, and, and depending on my situation, I would probably go with 421A over all of them. And the reason is, is because of the ease of use. 421A is only a two-part mixture. It's a binary blend. And it has a fractionation value, as I discussed with you before on the other ones. We're all very high, but with 421A, the fractionation value is very small. It's only 0.3 of a degree. So we don't even have thermometers that will really measure that type of temperature. And not only that, the pressure temperature relationship to achieve that 40 degree evaporator is exactly the same as R22. No difference, no discernible difference that you would be able to read on your gauge. So basically what I'm saying is if you were the technician and I painted this jug and it is green and wrote R22 in it, you probably would not be able to tell the difference. The main thing about the 421A that really leads me to that, if we're following the appropriate changeover procedures and we're changing those trigger valves, we shouldn't have leaks. But if a leak does occur because the fractionation value is 0.3, and then 0.3 with 410A as well, what that means is that can be ignored for service practices and to say that if I get a leak in a system and it leaks out half of its charge, the fractionation value is so low, I can now just top that back off and not have to worry about if the refrigerant fractionated, it's going to stay at the same capacity as it was before. But because it is a blend and it is not a true azeotrope, it can't be completely ignored. So when you introduce this refrigerant into the system, it's also done as a liquid. Because it does have that 0.3 fractionation value, we are going to introduce this refrigerant. And again, we don't have a dew point and bubble point charging for this. We can look on here and see 40 degrees for 421A is 68.72. If I looked at an R22 scale, it would be 68.71. You could not measure that hundredths of a tenth of a percent of difference in pressure reading. So for all intents and purposes, I'm going to be doing 
I don't have a lot of training I have to do with a technician. I can give him this and go. But we have to ask ourselves, all the other major manufacturers have produced refrigerants that are heavy fractionating, and for the most part, the drop-in replacements that don't require an oil change all have some sort of R600, your isobutanes and isopropanes in them. This one does not. And the, why they put that R600 in there is for the meniscability of the refrigerant to hold the oil. So when you use this refrigerant, it would benefit greatly if you did an oil change. But it doesn't require it because what the manufacturer has also put in with their two-part mixture is they have put in oil to help with that return. So when you charge this up and you send the refrigerant and you weigh the charge into the system, you're also sending some additional oil to help with oil return back to the compressor. Now with that said, you're going to have times where you have long runs. And the addition of POE oils, and some of the other ones also mention it, that if you have some oil flooding in the evaporator, the addition of a POE oil will benefit the system. A lot of times the biggest question is how much do I add? You know, I would tell you that with 421A, from the very beginning, whether it was a long run or not, I would add POE oil to the system. Um, when we charge that in, I mentioned in a previous video that we want to make sure we do it as a liquid, but when we go to top it off, if you will, or adjust the charge, we want to do that through the vapor side of the system while it's running so that we can get a pretty good eye on the charge. But with the liquid, we should never put it into an operating system. So make sure your gauges are always equipped with some sort of quick charger, insta charger, or throttling valve to throttle the refrigerant in so that when it goes in as a liquid, hits the throttling valve, changes from a liquid to a vapor so that we don't have the fear of compressor damage. There are many tools out there on the market to help with leaks. There's one called AC Leak Freeze with Magic Frost. And, and the reason I, it's not so much that I'm trying to do a commercial for this is that yes, the product's good and yes, it does work in certain applications, but what I like about this product is the tool that it comes with. Now, after I've used this, and this one happens to be for a refrigerator, it comes with a little device that I put onto the service valve position. Now save this syringe so that that way when you buy a jug or a can of POE oils to add when you're doing any one of the retrofits, now we can pull and suck the POE oil up in here. We've got a way to measure it. We can put four ounces of POE oil in inject it into the system so that we're adding that oil back to the system for oil return. Again, for the most part, most of these will work fine. But after you monitor them, you may find certain situations where we do have oil flooding in the evaporator and that addition of POE oils will help with that return. But out of all of them, all of them work. All of them are not going to be as efficient as R22. All of them are going to have some little loss of efficiency and capacity. And again, I want to really strongly encourage or nudge you in that if you have a unit that is operating our R22, that is already struggling with capacity and efficiency, that by going to any one of the replacement refrigerants for R22, you're not going to get it any better. As a matter of fact, you're probably going to make it worse and the resident is going to be even more unhappy or scream longer and louder during those summer days when the, the unit cannot keep up. If I had to make a decision on those units to change them, those would definitely go to 410A. That way I increase with my capacity and efficiency by getting them a new system, a new unit, and getting them switched over as quickly as possible to 410A. If I was going to use my retrofits and drop-ins to offset set the financial burden, then I would pick the units that were downstairs in the middle that have complete other units around them that help with the insulation values that aren't screaming about capacity and efficiency, use the refrigerant from their systems to keep the other ones on the ends going, and retrofit the center units. 
but eventually once the unit fails, you have to either do a compressor or a condenser change, then the changeover should be over to 410A. It's going to be less costly at that point because that system comes with its own refrigerant and you don't have to add to it. If I change the compressor, I have to look at five pounds of R22 at $800 a jug. You do the math. There's really no financial savings by changing a compressor and staying with R22 on that system. What I would like to hear from everybody at this point going over which refrigerants do you use, which ones are you getting the most success with, and what works best for you, and then what doesn't work. Hit the comment section below, and we look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you for watching.